Yeah, hello and welcome to another workshop here live from Hofer College. My name is Stefan, I'm a tutor and audio engineer here at Hofer College and today's topic is mixing modern metal. But I'm not the guy who's mixing the track we got here. Um, we have a very special guest, Mr. Dennis Watt. Hi, Dennis. Hey, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great. How are you? <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> yeah, uh, so um, the situation we have is kind of special or kind of common. Depends on how you see it. Um, we um, have a metal track, a modern metal track, um, which was recorded in a home studio, kind of rough environment. And... We used um, mainly um, virtual amplifiers, VST instruments uh, like strings, uh, virtual drums, and and whatnot. Um, first of all, I want to hear your opinion on this approach. Uh, how do you feel feel about that? Okay. Um, uh, yes, it's an opinion, nothing more. First of all, uh, I understand the circumstances, and I understand that uh, we were in a situation in the last couple of years where you just couldn't easily go to a studio and do your thing. I also understand about budgets, recording drums, costs money if you go to a studio, obviously. Yep. Um, and then, as I told you, uh, as a musician myself, that's something you just have to uh, come to terms with as a musician on your own because I, as a bass player, could not imagine in all my dreams of having an album that where maybe I wrote the songs and the bass line is programmed. That would <laughs> yes. not be acceptable for me, but I get it, you know, and drums and bass are not the same thing. So that's fine. However, using stuff like uh, virtual amplifiers and things like that, um, sure, why not? They sound good, you know. It's, um, there's nothing wrong with it. It's definitely a good way to get a quick, good sound. If I have to say there are any disadvantages, well, the one disadvantage is it's really, really hard to make your own identity using somebody else's stuff. At least you can still do stuff, but it's easier to be, say, how can you put it, to have your own identity if you use a special room with a special lamp, special circumstances, the moon's in the right place, whatever. You can really get your own thing. I mean, yeah. in the 80s, we all used Marshalls with Marshalls, and that was about it. We all had Marshalls, yeah. but everybody sounded different still. You know, so there's probably a way you can use your virtual instruments too to get your special sound um, if you're willing to work on it. You know, if you want to work hard, then then um, you can definitely try lots of things with tuning your drums weird or I don't know, just trying stuff out. Um, but having said that, what's definitely great in a track like this is that, which I'll show you in just a second when I turn the faders up, the mix is already half there. It all sounds good, you know? <laughs> yeah. I just. Uh, have to do a little bit of uh, here and there's or taste adjustments, and then we're already halfway there. So um, I, I guess you didn't explain yet that this is your band. You did explain that you recorded, yes. but this is your band, right? Yes, actually, so. it's my <laughs> band, and um, there's something special. Uh, the, the lyrics are in German, so I'm sorry for everyone who's not uh, speaking uh, German. If you have any questions about the lyrics, feel free to ask. Um, in general, if you have any questions, just put them here in the chat and we'll try to answer it to our, to our best. And um, yeah, um, just to uh, explain how this is working out today, um, we're going to uh, have one hour of streaming right here on YouTube for everyone. Then we're going to take a break for half an hour and then we'll continue uh, at uh, the online campus uh, for the students of Hofer College. Um, what I'm going to do next is uh, show you the um, virtual instruments and amplifiers we used uh, for this production. As I already said, uh, there's not many things that are actually <laughs> natural or really recorded except for the, the vocals and um, just some special element in this song, that, which uh, is kind of surprising for uh, this type of music. Um, so to start out, I want to show you the... Uh, amplifiers I used for the rhythm guitars. Um, I used um, um, the uh, STL uh, Tones Amp Hub, which is a um, subscription-based service. Um, they uh, keep on updating uh, their stuff with new models. Um, uh, I used the uh, Tremor 15, which is just another name for the PRS Tremonti 15, um, signature of uh, Alter Bridge guitarist um, 
Mark Tremonti for the left guitar and the um, obviously it's an EVH 5150 um, um, model and these were boosted um, with a um, copy of the precision drive by uh, Horizon Devices um, and just some EQ, uh, six band EQ um, before before the amp. You, you can see the the signal chain right uh, right here. Um, this is uh, how the how the how it's going. Um, what's kind of important to me for um, guitar sounds is not uh, mainly the amp, but the cabinet section. Um, for both guitars, um, I um, blended um, some impulse responses which came with the plugins. Um, these are mostly just, uh, they changed the names just a little bit so um, they don't get problems with the licensing and whatnot. Um, this is the um, Tremonti, um, uh, the left guitar, I guess, and this is, they call it Eagle, it's it's an angle 4x12, um, and the Kali rectifier is just the Mesa Overdrive rectifier, um, the, let's say, it modern standard for modern metal. I don't know... Uh, if Dennis uh, has some other suggestions or want to wants to disagree with me, <laughs> um, oh, I have no no suggestions, or do I disagree? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, yeah. For the um, for the EVH, uh, I used I don't know what what they meant with Origin. I'm not quite sure, but um, the uh, speaker is uh, called G G twelve M, which I suppose is the um, Celestian uh, G12M Greenback, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and I, as you can see, I just blended them just a little bit. Um, impulse responses always a uh, topic. Uh, there are many, many impulse responses out there, and some of them are better, some of them are worse. I think the one that came with the STL uh, amp, amp up work very well. So I just use them. You also have control over mic positioning, the angle you put the mic and whatnot. This is um, very versatile, I think. Um, let's go on with... Um, I would like to go on if it lets me. Yes. Um, with the clean guitars and lead guitars. Um, lead guitars is uh, this uh, Marshall type um, preamp uh, within the Overdrive uh, 2 uh, channel. And the this is uh, the model of the Victory uh, Black Amp um, I used for the clean guitars. Um, it also has to uh, clean an overdrive channel, but I used this for the clean guitars. Um, and um, yeah, um, that's about it uh, for the guitars. Um, next up is bass. This is the bass for Hellraiser by. Um, JST, uh, uh, Joe Sturgis tones. Uh, I disabled the the cabinet se section uh, for since it was uh, a bit muddy sounding. Um, yeah, just great tone for uh, blending with the DI track and just uh, um, really really good for uh, modern metal sounds. Um, we have some suggestions in the chat. Uh, Marshalls and tube screamers. Yes, of course. <laughs> That's uh, actually a great combination. Also, Tube Screamer for boosting uh, an amp, always a great idea, I think, um, just to get a, a tight low end and some extra boost. Um, Clearton Grindstein, ever ever heard about that, Dennis? What? Sorry. The Clearton Grindstein or Grindstein. I don't know of that, no. Is that a plug-in or...? Uh, it's, I think it's both. It's, um, um, it's um, a pedal that... Uh, imitates the sound of the um, 90s um, Swedish death metal chainsaw type of sound okay. <laughs> that actually um, I guess it was developed uh, in cooperation with Christian Kohler okay. but that's actually pretty interesting it, um, but let's continue with the drums uh, it's also pretty common in um, modern metal productions today um, this is Get Good Drums uh, this is the P P4 kit um, overall we have some strings going on this is the Nucleus Light um, just some for the string section and not very spectacular this is the um, stock um, sampler, stock piano of Persona Studio One 
not the best um, piano plugin out there, but um, since it was layered uh, in the background, I thought that'll do. <laughs> so um, yeah, let's have a look at the disc, uh, shouldn't we, Dennis? Well, um, you've got the, you see the tracks, I take it, yeah. Um, here we got. Uh, I've organized a bit here. I've made some folders of the groups. We got drums. We have the guitars, which I've also included the bass in there. And usually I would actually put the bass up here, just because, I don't know, I do that. Um, I got a folder for the keys. I've also put the saxophone in the keys. I wasn't aware that that was a real saxophone, but it doesn't matter. I wanted to put it somewhere. Yeah, that's actually the one um, real instrument the one real in instrument here. <laughs> is a saxophone. Very good. And then I've got the uh, vocals, of course. So here we have all our tracks. Um, I just laid everything out. I've done no processing at all so far. I did make a master bus for the drums just because I wanted to get that out of the way. Mm -hmm. And I did a little bit of leveling, you know, nothing happening. I forgot to actually ask you, by the way, uh, what the, the tempo of the song was. Oops. I uh, that's 125. 125. Okay. And I should get that put in. Okay. 125. Why is my... Oh, there it is. It's on the other screen. Excuse me. <laughs> 120. Oh, it is at 125. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, it's all fine. All right. I'm going to actually start by just listening to the song. I'll probably make some fader movements as I go, just to get familiar with the song. It's um, the easiest way to mix a song that you've never heard before. Had I recorded it, I might go about it differently because I'd had have a better overview yep. and know with what I'm dealing with. But now I'm just going to start playing back and listening. Okay. Keep that in mind. There's a side stick there. Yeah. Go! 
Yeah. Great stuff. So, um, yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm gonna shamelessly <coughs> plug myself right now. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, since I forget to mention the name of the band, uh, this is uh, the band is called Slaw Terror, and the song is called Stille, will be released tomorrow. Um, so, yes, this is kind of an exclusive uh, preview. Yeah, very so, good. Yeah, um, so, where <coughs> do you want to start, Dennis? Well, I want to start by explaining why I listened to the song front to back. Um, because listening to a song front to back and visualizing and seeing stuff it m raises questions it points things out that i wasn't aware of let's start with the end for example every chorus and choruses are almost always at these three positions so there's always three of them <laughs> there's always a solo about there and a middle part about there and there's always an end around there so i realize here at the last chorus we have uh, an extra lead vocal or rather the shout exists on the last chorus only I have to keep that in mind. That's a mental note I've got, I got to make because um, uh, I might want to feature it. I might not. I might want to erase it later. I don't know, no, but it's there. Yep. And then, for example, I saw, I did not hear, at this position, there was a, um, a uh, keyboard, which I don't hear because I have a weird routing here. I can only listen by uh, soloing it. Okay. And when I play that spot... I, I'm assuming that should be uh, uh, more in front at that point because it's just a little thing, but obviously it was there for a reason. So I'm going to keep that in mind too. Uh, other things that I was watching out for was, uh, well, we heard that the, uh, the snare goes to the side stick at this point, right? And what I'm immediately going to do is I'm going to duplicate my um, track here. My snare, even though there's nothing on it yet. And, uh, oh, I actually wanted that to go here. And I'm going to put this side stick stuff uh, down here for now on another track. Okay. I'm going to call this snare side just to have it. It's just because it's easier to work with, you know, uh, especially if I start doing some triggering and stuff and whatnot. But anyway, as you can already probably hear, um, I don't have far to go with this mix. Um, I don't have to do any real treatment. I don't have to fix things. Okay, now it's just a matter of uh, rounding some things off. And I have leveled off the drums more or less. Okay, sounds like I heard a delay there of something. Oh, look at that, I messed up. <laughs> What happened? I had actually moved the snare Ooh. track. Okay. Ah, nobody needs a snare. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> not important. Did I do it there as well? I sure did, didn't I? Okay. Luckily, I'm on a quantize, so I have to move this as well, or we're going to be in trouble there, too. Let me zoom in. Yeah. Okay, everything's where it should be. Very, very good. So, how do I start? Well, um... Now that I've got a balance going, kind of a very rough balance, where I can at least en enjoy the song and appreciate what's going on in there, I would probably about now start with the drums, okay? Um, but in this case, because I'm, I'm working differently today in general, I uh, usually mix, I do summing, I have a small mm -hmm. mixing board and I mix 20 audio channels together, you know, my drums, maybe two stereo buses of drums, 
a stereo bus for bass and maybe some auxiliary, a uh, stereo bus for rhythm guitars, overdubs, keyboards, lead vocal, backing vocals, and effects. Okay, so these are all stereo buses. Now I'm doing everything out of a stereo, one single stereo bus called the main bus. And I've made a group uh, for this main bus be only because for this uh, live streaming thing, I've got to send signals here and there. And so this was the easiest way to do it. And this is why I cannot solo stuff uh, direct from the track right now. This is, uh, for me, unfortunate. But then again, maybe I could actually uh, <laughs> set this up that it does that. Uh, maybe, but I don't know how. So I'm not going to mess with it. Um, so I'm going to actually start by doing what a lot of people do these days, and that's um, treating the main bus uh, I'm not the biggest fan of doing this, but mainly because of the way I work. And I do have some things at, at home that I uh, use in my system, like a Neve EQ, a 1073 EQ stereo. That's on the bus, as well as a compressor, but it's in delta mode. So that means it's combining the natural signal, the unprocessed signal, with a processed signal, which is an EQ like this and a compressor. Okay. okay. So um, I'm going to start with this EQ which has been boosted a little bit at 100 hertz. And on a very broad bandwidth, I've boosted 10K. I've made a hi-fi curve. I've boosted 110, right? That's the typical bass treble curve of a hi-fi system. So this is what it sounds like. We'll go to the chorus to hear what it, uh, the difference is. It gets bigger, it's also bassier, and uh, I asked myself if maybe the bass just isn't too loud before I start EQing anything, but um, that's doing that. And also because I want to have a little bit of the vibe of my, um, my API 2500 that I have in my place, I'm going to use this in the, the bus, but I'm going to try to not use it too much and just you know reduce a couple of dbs okay i've got a very very low ratio i'm going to do two to one fast release um this tone type i'm going to keep it on old for now the uh the link which is um combining the the way it compresses left and right the percentage is between nothing to 100 and i'm going to keep it about 80 percent high and low pass filter on the 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 detector I just like the way it works this way. And this is what it's going to sound like. So as you can see, it's, it's really just doing a very, very little bit of, um, of compression at a very low ratio. It's gluing a little bit together. Okay. I will probably come back to this and do some stuff. And I'm going to just leave it on for now and uh, work around it. So that's my bus processing for the beginning. I might do other things, we'll see, but for the moment, I'm gonna keep it simple. So now we're gonna go to our drums. And like I said, the stuff is actually pretty far, so there's not a whole hell of a lot to do. For example, um, let me uh, actually close my folders and mute these first so that I have a don't have to solo everything so we have our toms and because this is a VCI I have no crosstalk <laughs> I don't have to fix anything there the same with the snare I mean this is every engineer's dream the snare is a snare no hi-hat no Bass drum, nothing coming through. Mm -hmm. All very nice and simple. But we're going to pretend like I don't have uh, this beautifully uh, cleaned up snare. And I'm going to show how I would usually start with gating. I like to start getting a gating thing out of the way. Just because it um, makes my life a bit easier. And I'm going to copy the snare track as I've done. I'm going to change the color just because. First thing I'm going to do is take it out of the bus so it's not anywhere yet, right? Well, actually, I could leave it in for a second just to show something. Oh, I have a channel strip on there, too, I see, but it's not doing anything. It was just there to see if it was working. Now I'm um, going to actually put it right back in the bus for a second so I can better explain what I'm doing. Okay? 
So this is my snare, and I'm going to use this to trigger, oh, no, rigor, trigger, now it says something even weirder. Okay, trigger gate. Uh, get rid of that too. So the whole purpose of this will be to trigger my gate. I'm going to use this to side chain a gate. Now I'm going to also just start by um, putting in a number that um, I think works well. This is a um, track delay, the setting, and I'm doing a ne negative de delay. In other words, I'm setting this track forward so that if I play them both together, you'll hear there's a bit of a flammy sound if I go farther. So this is like minus 2.07 milliseconds now in front. And I think two milliseconds is probably a, a good position. And now I'm going to go back and take it out of the bus because obviously I do not want to hear that. It's just going to be there for gating. And as I said, I don't need a gate here, but I'm going to put one on there just to, for the sake of doing it. So I'll use the standard... Uh, Cubase gate, and I'll activate the side chain. So I'll go to my sends. I'm going to go to this uh, side chain here, make this pre fader just so that there's no influence. This is the only influence to the side chain, this one slider, which I'm going to leave at zero because it's all it's got to do. I will also solo defeat this track so that when I solo something else, this will always be active, right? Okay, so now I've got this track triggering this gate. I want a very fast gate. I don't need it very long. Let's see what happens. There's my gate. It's looser. It's tighter, as you can hear. I don't know how dynamic it is. I'm going to leave it around there unless I hear something weird. Usually about here should do. Let's say I want a really short snare or a long snare. Go about here. That's the range of how much is gating. About that much should be enough. As you see, I don't have a top and bottom snare. I'd usually do this to the top, the bottom. Maybe there's a third mic as well. In this case, I don't have that. And it doesn't matter anyway. Actually, uh, in uh, you get the possibility in get good drums. I just uh, yeah yeah. I, sure. I, I, I didn't think it's necessary just for the. It's not. The, I mean, it's in this case, to know. in this case, it's not. Yeah. Yeah, I was just saying that if I did, I would yeah do the same thing, and I would just uh, put a gate on on the uh, bottom snare. Yep. And then send here to the bottom snare the the same thing. But there's a reason I've got this uh, gate as well because we can do stuff with it uh, later. And it's going to come in handy, so... We got a question in the chat. If you sure. would use a physical trigger uh, when you're um, using uh, real drums, would you put a trigger, for example, on the snare to... Um, no, I wouldn't. ...to fire a gate? No, I wouldn't. Because um, they're accurate, they're fast, but they're not phase correct as, as well as like a slate trigger or something like that. It's, it's, uh, it actually looks at the, the transients point and the first curve of your transients and matches phase based on this, right? Okay. Because having a real snare and a trigger, if you have a bad phase correlation, it's going to sound weird, right? And I don't tr uh, trust these these trigger things. <laughs> I know some producers that actually, you know, they go through every drum hit and set a, a MIDI point, you know? Yeah. And, and that's fine, too, because MIDI is lightning fast, you know? And if that works for you, that's fine. I don't find it necessary, to be honest. Okay. Um, especially after doing some gating, stuff like that. I could actually, at one point, let's say, gate my snare. Let's say there's a snare fill, right? And it's really quiet here, and it's not loud enough to open my gate, right? Well, all I got to do in this case is just say, okay, this, this one hit isn't opening my gate. Well, I just cut that and make it louder. Okay. It's going to open my gate for sure, right? Um, let's say I have a crescendo happening somewhere. da 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 da, -da. I just make all of them louder, and then my gates are going to open. And then I could render this track gated extra and use that to trigger my drums, if necessary. Like I said, I have zero crosstalk here, so <laughs> it's, uh, it's not going to be a big deal. It's not a problem. 
The toms, uh, kind of the same thing, um, but usually what I do with toms is I just go in there and um, gate them by hand. I am one of these weird people that actually like crosstalk on toms. I never clean my toms um, this well, where they're really, you know, like nothing uh, after the toms. I would, let's say if this was normal with crosstalk and everything happening, I would take like here, make a little cut, um, then cut here as well. Uh, make a big cross fade and then uh, turn down the level like 10 dB. You know, so that would be in between the toms, I have 10 dB reduction, but still leakage. So I like the sound of a little bit of leakage on my drums. It sounds kind of uh, messy, but it sounds more powerful. And uh, if you don't have a good room mics, it's also a bit help to make your drum sound wider, a little bit of leaking left and right, especially if you pan your toms around a little bit, okay? But as I said, um, we don't have this issue here. And now I gotta figure out where my undo buttons are because I'm on a Mac with a PC keyboard. <laughs> but one of these buttons has to do something. Okay, it's not. So I'll do it this way. Undo, 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 and undo. And again, undo. Oh, it doesn't matter. But I really wish I could figure that out now. Is it like this or like this? No. no. Also, yeah, there we go. I got it. It's the Apple okay. key. No, no, it's the Windows key. Figure it out. Good. Okay. Um, maybe I panned the toms a little bit, but the way it looks to me, because these are stereo tracks, is they are panned already. Yes. Right? So I don't have to deal with that at all. I'm often writing emails to my clients asking which perspective it was recorded in, you know, drummer perspective or listener perspective. I'm a fan of listener perspective because I'm a listener and not a drummer. Uh, but in this case, as you can see, Tom 1 is definitely more left and Tom 2 is definitely more right. So we have a drummer perspective, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, next thing I'm going to do here is actually group my toms. We only have two, but, you know, what the hell. I'm going to make a stereo group, and I'm going to send it into my master, my drum master bus. We'll call it Tom Group. So now I can just quickly solo. Oh, it doesn't even want to. Why not? Because I didn't put it in the right output, apparently. So let's do it again. Okay, one did it. The other did not. Okay, now it should. There we go. Okay, that's out of the way. Um, snare, I would usually group my snare mics as well together. Sometimes with kick you have two or three mics and I would group those two. I don't have to do that now. So I'm gonna work a little bit on this drum room, which sounds really good, by the way. I must be honest, it sounds quite cool. Um, what I hear, and this is also true in the real world, um, your left and right room mics are very, very often not symmetrical in sound. It might be brighter on one side, or bass drum is louder over there, and snare is louder over there. And um, what I like to do a lot in this case is to narrow these rooms up a little bit. Often you'll have room mics that are literally six, seven meters away from each other. You know, they're really wide. I think that sounds weird when you have that wide of a room. Nobody listens to sound wider than their ears space between their heads. So um, okay. I like this little plug-in for two reasons. First of all, I like to mono my low frequencies. And I'll usually go around 200 hertz or more on a room. So everything from 237 and below is mono now. OK, we actually I got another question in the chat. Um, and uh, Christian asks, uh, how would you do uh, that gating technique with more bleed on the original track? Uh, if um, using the track as a trigger for a gate would be uh, difficult um, if you have more bleed on the track. Um, yeah, let's say very easily, actually. Um, and that's uh, something that's easier to point out when I have the problem, should the problem arise. But let's say, for example, I don't know, here's a tom fill, right? Here's a tom fill. And here's my snare track, right? And let's say that here you could see blah, 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 all these toms. And of course, these, these, these crosstalks here would make my gate open, right? Yeah. Well, it was an easy trick. I'd cut here, I'd cut here, and I'd erase it. 
so it won't open my gate. Maybe it's a little tiny spot. Maybe here's a little fill. Maybe right there. So I just delete it. It doesn't open my gate. That's it. That's the trick. Okay. So uh, my gate still works as it do- should. And anything that I ne- I use this track to manipulate my gate. That's all it comes down to. If there's some crosstalk that's opening my gate, I get rid of it. If there's a hit that's not loud enough, I'll make it louder. I almost never have to make anything quieter because I want it to open. That's the only point of it is to open the gate, right? Okay. So I would just remove things in between that uh, influence my gate in, in the way I don't want it to be, see? And that's it. And that's the beauty of doing it this way is that you can you have absolute total control of your gate quickly, right? All right. <laughs> okay. So back to these rooms. So let's go back here. Like I said, I got this plug-in on it. I'm monitoring uh, first the, the, the bottom end up. And now I'm going to reduce the width, the stereo width. So that's without. And that's width. I've got it a little bit more concrete now, okay? That's all, right? So, now that's out of the way. Something I would do uh, pretty normally at this point is also put some kind of um, distortion or saturation on it. Uh, I like this plugin a lot for for that. Right out of the the, the, the (laughs) box, it already sounds quite cool. Right? Maybe too much, I might take it down a bit. This is just a mix knob. And what I really like is, because in rooms you have lots of symbols and stuff like that, and I love this, this uh, darkness feature that warms it up a bit. Right? Some people don't like that. So I'm going to turn it off. What other things, what else you can do is um, like uh, adding a de to your rooms to get rid of your symbols a bit. And let's just try that, DS, and I will take the IQ DSer, which actually has a pretty cool preset, by the way. Let's see if I can find it. And it was, uh, yeah, two loud cymbals. Cool. So. Well, they're not too loud here. Well, uh, this is definitely a, a good room. I mean, like I said, it really actually sounds very good, this room. So uh, I don't have to do a lot of that. But I actually still think it's a bit bright. I don't want it to be that bright. I prefer that. Okay, this double deluxe makes it very loud, too, so... That's why the sound is just changing so much when I turn it off. Okay. But I love the power it makes. Mm-hmm. Okay. So now that we've gotten this far, at this point, I would um, duplicate that track. And let me give it another color because I can. And I'm going to use this now uh, pretty much like it was... Well, I don't need that. Uh, is set up for the uh, in the normal room. I'm going to put a gate on this too, right? A gate tur, a gate. Where's my gate? Which is going to be triggered by this snare that we've made here, right? And I'm going to turn the fader down for now because I'm going to use it for something later. But just to get it out of the way now, so it's out of my head, I'm going to uh, send this to the, the, the gate. I have to activate the um, side chain, of course. Where is it? It's over here. So activate my side chain. And now I'm going to go here to my snare to trigger gate, to my sends, and I'm going to send it to drum room. You see here. Again, pre fader, just because it's easier. So when I solo this snare, if you listen to it, with this room, rather, you see it's doing that, right? Okay, uh, I have a couple of milliseconds delay because the room mic is usually farther away and I 
don't want to hear the sound of the gate opening early, so I, I'm going to leave it like that. The range, I'm going to leave it down for now. I'm going to look for a curve that fits. An envelope filter, I mean, an envelope of how it comes in and out. Okay, that's fine for now. And I'm just doing some basic things that I, I would do for a start. I'm going to come back and change stuff, but I'm going to get this out of the way. For now, Hof uh, Reverb I'm going to throw in here. So I'm going to put a reverb on this duplicated room. What's this? Okay. Uh, let's see if I got any presets on my laptop. This is a good question. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I do not. So I'm going to look for a little plate. I'm going to start by lengths, and I'm going to go for a shorter one first. I don't know, something like here. Oh, what is that? Uh, small something that looks weird. So now I'm just going to start trying stuff out because I was not smart enough to make a preset. And I can't see anything that I actually remember. I don't want a synthetic one. Okay, what's this? Let's see what that sounds like. That's not very good. Okay. Maybe a longer one. Smallest plate. That's very small, even though it should be longer. 220. <laughs> Anything else? Medium hall plate. Oh, that sounds like a room. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so here's the, what I've done to this. I've just gated this so that it's affected by uh, snare only, and I've put a reverb on it. And the reason I've done this is because I like the way this, this track sounds with the reverb on it compared to actually putting reverb on the snare mic itself. To me, that always sounds wishy-washy. No matter what I try... It doesn't have the power. And here, you'll hear that this snare sounds explosive already, the reverb. So let's add it to our sound. So there's our drum room off. And this is our... That's my reverb, right? I'll call it drum room reverb. And that's going to be my snare reverb for this session. I'm still keeping it down because I don't know how much I will need or if at all. Because that room actually sounds really good. <laughs> you know, I I'm, I'm, don't know if I'm going to need it. So keep it right about there. Uh, I haven't done any EQ yet because I haven't felt it necessary. So... Now here's uh, the overheads. This also sounds to me oddly wide, to be honest. Um, so I'm gonna put another one of these plugins on it. If this were a real overhead, because I like getting, getting the body of the snare from the overheads, like the 200 hertz punch, I'm actually gonna mono the, the bottom here as well, just because uh, I want that tightness, and I've had it often, you know, with weirdly placed overheads that, that the snare might be louder on one side than the other. So uh, let's assume that this is a, a real-world problem right now. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to narrow it up a little bit. Okay. Sounds fine to me. This is our direct cymbals. Meaning, I'm going to actually make this track louder just so that we can see what's going on because it's so quiet. It's hard to tell what's happening. Ah, yeah, and I see stuff. Okay, I'll turn it down. Okay, direct symbols. That is overheads, hi-hats, and everything. Okay, this is completely isolated, which is fine. So I'm just going to leave it alone and just turn it up as I need it, if I need it. Okay, I'm going to go start with some EQ here. 
I'm gonna use a channel strip. I oh, that's not a channel strip. Sorry, I was too fast and didn't pay attention. This is the channel strip. Oh, it's on the other drum thing. Here we go. Okay, let's start with this. I like the way the SSL strip in fast attack mode controls the peak of the snare and the overheads a lot. It sounds very powerful to me and it's uh, something I commonly do. Okay. I still haven't used any EQ. I don't feel necessary still. All good. Okay, this is interesting. Normally at this point I'd be on the phone with the uh, with my client asking him why I have symbols here and there, but not here. Because <laughs> here I have symbols and I have this direct symbol channel where nothing is happening. This was uh, <laughs> usually meant as a su supportive uh, track for um, basically for the for the right end. Um, okay. For the and and the hi hat, okay. If necessary. If necessary, understood. Okay. So okay, I hear a splash there. The hi hat. Okay. All right, I'm just gonna throw it in about there. That's fine for now. So what I'm we trying to do now is get you know a real drum sound going. Just okay. to explain, I'm I'm just I'm listening to drums only, trying to turn myself on to having a an interesting drum sound that I think works well with this music. And I'm just trying to get it out of the way in rough form, nothing else. Okay, um, there's actually another question. Sure. And um, if you're mixing me met metal, um, does too much cymbals uh, in your mix make uh, the drums lose attack in your opinion due to a washout effect? And um, are there any workarounds? Uh, yes, take away the frequencies that bother you, you know? I hear a lot of, I'm not gonna complain. It's taste, I know how it is. A lot of modern metal productions where I don't hear cymbals at all. <laughs> it, it seems to be uh, people are scared of them because it, um, I don't know, messes up the guitar solo or I don't know what. Um, kind of a shame because cymbals crashes make, make aggression and it's just cool. If I have a feeling that there's maybe one cymbal or something weird happening and there's a, a certain frequency that's, that's really annoying, that's just standing out when he hits it, I'm, I'm on seek and destroy mode. I'm either going to, you know, do a notch filter to try to get rid of that, or I'm going to use a dynamic EQ, which I'm a, a, I'm a big fan of. Again, you know, we don't have any issues here where I could actually show how that would work. Because, like, the cymbals are very smooth sounding and there's no weird penetrant sound. But if there would be, in this case, I would um, do something like this. I would, uh, on a very, very narrow band, 12 to 13 uh, Q, very, very narrow, I would look for a frequency that's annoying me, or try to at least. Which I can't find. <laughs> but let's say, just for argument's sake, it was here, right here at uh, 4.3, right? We're going to go to 4.3, whatever. And I'll use a d this dynamic EQ and maybe just tell it to, uh, I don't know. You see when some symbols are hit, it's pulling it down. Maybe I can compensate by actually EQing that as well. Um, I got to be really clear in this. I don't want to complain again. I'm not going to say you're doing it the wrong way or he or, he or she's doing it the wrong way. This, these are well-recorded cymbals. They, they sound great. They're, they're, they're smooth. They don't hurt. They're bright without being painful. Um, a lot of the cheaper home recordings these days are 50-euro Behringer microphones into a 100-euro Behringer desk, and they sound very brittle. Your cymbals sound painful, you know. 
that's the way it is. <laughs> that's not much you can do about that. And I'm not suggesting harsh words about <laughs> harsh symbols. <laughs> yeah, you're. You know, I'm not suggesting everybody should go out and spend lots of money and get the best mics and stuff like that. But you got to understand that this is the difference. This is yeah. quite simply just a difference. And if you're expecting to sit in your cellar with your 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 little collection of microphones and your laptop, then you're gonna get a I don't know an Andy Sneap sound. Well, you know, good on you. You know, it's uh, gonna be hard. It's gonna be really really difficult. Uh, but in that case, if if I thought there was something bothering me with the symbols, I'd look for ways to to warm it up. That being one way. Another way is quite literally like um, adding uh, something like a preamp. Here's an Eve preamp, for example, and subtle distortion does wonders for harsh sounds. I mean, wonders. You can really just uh, clear stuff up by distorting it, as weird as it sounds. <laughs> it, it actually gets softer, depending on the kind of distortion, you know, obviously. But a preamp distortion, a tape simulation, lots of these things do, do wondrous jobs of this. Um, I'll be shameless and plug something here, too. Plug-in Alliance have this um, plug-in called uh, the Refinement, okay? And I'm not 100% sure what this thing is. It's some kind of a tape simulation and tube and whatever. But it does a hell of a job of, of uh, softening up annoying frequencies and making it actually sound bigger. And it has a saturation knob that I'm, I'm using a lot. And uh, I can actually demonstrate here. Let's start here and um, let's turn all this off. You can hear how that really softens things up. And then if I add some distortion, it actually makes it sound bigger, you know? It's, okay. it's a great tool for stuff like that, you know? So if you have uh, problems like that, harshness is never nice, just never nice. Fixing that is always a good idea as early as possible in your mix stage, you know. I'm almost always looking for stuff I don't like first when I'm doing a mix. That's annoying me. This frequency is standing out. The symbols are too harsh. This is too much of this and that. And then I'll fix that before I actually start mixing because it yep. makes it easier. Like I said, we don't have this problem here. I just turned the faders up. It already sounds good. So that's already been taken care of for me, which, yep. is, which is fantastic, you know. So here I am with some good recorded drums, and now i got to make it sound interesting. Okay. <laughs> so now we're going to go to the toms. Um, um, just a quick reminder, we're, uh, we have only five minutes left on this part of the, okay. of the stream. So um, we have some uh, questions or some suggestions popping up, uh, mm -hmm. like um, someone asking uh, that he really wants to see a workshop with bad recorded signals. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> that would be interesting. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not quite sure about that, but I guess you did a series called Can Your Song Be Mixed? I don't know what yes. this was all about. Yes, yes. Um, um, Unfortunately, no bad recordings. <laughs> okay, you're right. <laughs> okay, um, but um, the thing is, uh, yes, the um, the drums were recorded by uh, some top engineers uh, uh, at Get Good Drums. Yes. Um, Mr. Nolly Getgood uh, was mm -hmm. in charge of that, and okay. but the rest of the the signals were all recorded, ba basically recorded in my living room. So um, okay. I don't know if we call it bad recordings, but no, it's shouldn't. quite common for uh, home recording uh, people. Yes. Um, so yeah, the, these are not uh, the rest is not I'd say top notch studio recordings. It's just three guys yep. uh one interface yeah, yeah um, but that's the other reality to it is you can with a little interface in your living room bedroom do great stuff i mean it's here I, we hear it it's, it's all there you know no question about it it becomes an issue when you start wanting to have realness let's say i want to record my 5150 head i insist on it okay lots of factors do i have a cabinet that that matches do i like what's coming out of the speaker to begin with because if that doesn't turn you on, there's no mic, an EQ setting in the world that's going to help, you know. So that's got to be available. And, and if it's not, and you do a DI recording with a plug-in on it, well, great. That, it's working for you. It's fine. Nothing wrong with that. It's um, an easy, quick way to do things, yep, obviously. I'd and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. There's definitely nothing wrong with it. 
um, it's hard to show what I would do in this situation <laughs> when I have good tracks. You yes. Know? Um, which is I'm happy about. I have been in the situation where I've had tracks that are really, really difficult to work with, and I would do certain things. I'm at the point in my life, to be honest, when I get songs sent to me that are atrocious and, and sound like they need some serious help, I'll probably just not do the job before I, I kill myself trying to make garbage <laughs> sound good. It's, it's, it's not worth it to me anymore. <laughs> yeah. I have to be honest with you. you know? it's, uh, I've yeah. turned down more jobs in the last five years than the 20 years before that. Okay. Wow. Because, <laughs> okay. no offense, but people record their own stuff. And they think, okay, we'll just give it to him and he'll make it sound good. And then I turn the faders on and go, nope, 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 nope. I'm not, nope, I'm not going to do that either. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'm thankful for a, a recording like this compared to that, if yeah, you understand what I mean. Very nice. When it, uh, if you want to learn recording or mixing, yeah. uh, someone asked, how would I sign up for Hofa? I, I'm not sure if you mean the, the online courses. Uh, you can... Um, Go to our website and of uh, hofer-college.com, um, I guess. There should be a link in the description. Um, and you can sign up for our online courses. Um, this would also give you access to the uh, um, next two parts of um, uh, our workshop, which are taking place uh, exclusively at the online campus. And uh, we're going to have a break of uh, half an hour right now, and then we'll continue with... Um, The rest of the um, um, drums, the um, guitars, vocals, which are actually kind of rough. I, I guess this will, will be uh, kind of interesting. We have uh, mm -hmm. clean vocals and uh, guttural vocals yeah. as well, as yeah. you already heard. Yes. So, uh, um, any, uh, yeah, uh, actually, there's another question. Sure. Does uh, the BX refinement work well on vocals? It works well on anything that sounds harsh. I mean, literally anything. I've used it on so many things. I've used it on harsh cymbals. It saved a, a bad violin recording. It literally saved it. I've had rough guitars where it really did, did a hell of a job. I've even used it on mastering. You know, It's a pretty damn interesting plug-in. It's, it's really a great um, softener plug-in, if I want to put it that way. It softens without making it sound dead. Okay. okay? And what I really like is, is it softens without it sounding EQ'd, you know, and that's, that's a, it's a bonus. It can be very useful, but it's not for everything, you know, like most plugins. Yeah. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. You got to try. Yep. So one last question we, before we gonna take a break. Um, how hard is dr fixing drum face? I don't know what you mean by... Uh, drum face. Uh, right. uh, um, in the recording, in the DAW, or uh, when it comes to mic placement? Okay, well, <laughs> everything's an issue. Um, it's great if you can get it right when you're recording. You know, drum correlation is for me top priority. I don't have to do it here because it's it's you know it's it's all worked out. It's all fine. I might find issues, for example, with tune track drums. I often find phase issues, to be honest. Ooh, interesting. Often, yes, it's it's very interesting. Actually, it's not as bad as it used to be. But um, I remember the first time I got, I don't know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I got a, a mix to do with tune track drums, and the snare and the overheads were out of phase. They were just out of phase with each other. Interesting. Yeah, and I thought it was something <laughs> I did, but uh, it turned out it was wrong. Um, okay. But phase correlation is really important, checking it every process in your recording, in, in your mixing. It's, it's, you know, between relation between your overheads and your individual mics or overheads and rooms and rooms and individual mics. It's very important, very important. Okay, um, that's it for, uh, for this part. Um, we're going to take the break now, and uh, I hope you liked that part of, the, um, of our workshop, uh, Mixing Modern Metal. And yeah, um, to the students of Hofer College, we'll see you in <coughs> half an hour.